Hello, this is Harry Gearman from the Bloodstained Men, and we are very honored to have with us today Professor Peter Adler, a professor of law from uh, Massachusetts, from Wellesley. And uh, he has written an excellent book, which we want to discuss. Uh, it's called Circumcision is a Fraud, The Coming Legal Reckoning. And this is a landmark book. This is not, um, this is a serious major e event in the history of, of uh, intactivism and the fight against genital mutilation. So this is a really important uh, moment that we have. And we're very honored to have Peter Adler with us. Thank you so much, Harry, and for your kind words. I'm really happy to, to be with uh, you here to talk about the book. The book was just like um, a bolt out of the blue. It's just, it's just great. I've been, you know, dreaming of, of a authoritative legal analysis of the problem because, you know, I'm not a lawyer. None of, none of the bloodstained men are lawyers. We, we know there's got to be legal problems here, but until you get a professional, you really don't know. And, and this book really takes apart the, the crime of, of circumcision, the, the fraud and the, the, the open crime of it. Yes, so the book is based on a published law review article. Um, so uh, Robert Van Howe, uh, Travis Wisdom, Felix Stas, and I published an article in November 2020 um, in the Cornell Journal of Law and Medicine called Is Circumcision a Fraud? where we asked whether it is and we argued that it is. Um, so it's not just my saying so. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Van Howe, who's written more than 100 papers on circumcision, but also the Cornell Journal of, of Law and Public Policy that, um, you know, carefully proofed the, the uh, article and was willing to publish it because they believe the claims in it are true. And so I feel now safe to say it's a fraud. We've been holding up a sign that this circumcision is medical fraud, but, you know, hoping, you know, no, <laughs> hoping we're right. But it, now I feel like, okay, we're on solid ground. It's, this is established fact. Uh, so. Thank you for those banners, by the way. It was really gratifying to see them. And you are in the solid ground holding up those banners. Yep. In my it's it's always awesome for anybody who has a chance to join a bloodstained men protest who understands the issue. It's, uh, you know, it is very gratifying to be out there and uh, let it be known that you're no longer accepting the lies that you've been told. So we have now uh, solid legal backing to, to, to uh, back us up. Uh, when I read your book, I uh, was wondering, a, a couple of questions came up. One is, um, what, is, what is the extent of the liability and who is liable? If there's, I think you mentioned 130 million circumcised men alive today in America, something like that. Um, I forgot what the number is, but um, a, a lot. And almost all of them would have been circumcised without their consent. So that's a cumulative liability that's got to be just astronomical. Is there a way to assess that? Yes, I believe so, Harry. So um, I guess published figures are that there may be 350 million people in the United States. So 175 million men and uh, maybe 85% of them are circumcised, um, even though the rate today is perhaps 55%. So you have 80% of 175 million people, males are circumcised, whether they're boys or men. And so in the book, I, I argue that um, physicians and hospitals um, have uh, committed child abuse against every one of those boys when they were boys, of course, excepting the very rare instance where it's medically necessary to circumcise a boy, but that's, that number is extremely low, like half a percent or less. So essentially all these circumcised boys and men didn't need to be. And 
the book argues that it's child abuse and that every one of them had a claim. And so then the question is, do they still have a claim today? Could they bring suit? And the book isn't just theoretical. It talks about, well, can, can boys and men bring suit? Um, and uh, in the course of doing the research, I, uh, I recalled the dis so-called discovery rule that if you've been defrauded, but you don't know it, then your claim, your legal claim doesn't begin to, the statute of limitation doesn't begin to run until you learn of the fraud. It's called the discovery rule. And so in theory, uh, every one of these boys and men has a claim no matter how, when they were circumcised, even if it was, were 50 years ago. Um, so the further that in the past that somebody was circumcised, the less courts are gonna be inclined to rule that way. But in theory, they all have claims. They all have uh, fraud claims um, because nobody knows it's a fraud. I mean, you held up the banners and I've written the article, but you know, there are really only a few hundred people who've read the article or the book and know the, the argument that circumcision is a fraud. So this is kind of breaking news to the world. Um, and uh, I think the, the, um, the article in the book, I tried to make it a work of scholarship. It isn't just, uh, um, it's not mere advocacy. Of course, I'm an opponent of circumcision, but it's really well documented. There are 685 footnotes in the book. And as I said, the book just builds upon the article in the Cornell Journal of Law, uh, Law and Public Policy. And the editors told me, well, we want to make it bulletproof. Says if we're accusing somebody of fraud, well, we better be right. And um, of course, they're not responsible for the article, but I'm saying they came to the conclusion that it's a fraud as well. So yeah, in answer to your question, Harry, in, in my view, all these boys and men have, have a claim today. Awesome. So that's got to have somebody shaking in their boots. Well, I mean, so far, uh, the American medical profession has just become more and more brazen about their claims about circumcision. Um, the book argues that the claims have never been valid and it will never be possible to justify unnecessary non-consensual genital cutting, whether it's male or female. Um, but the proponents of circumcision have been making claims about it for the last 150 years. And the claims in the past were often ridiculous, such as that it prevents or cures many and even all diseases, which is the classic claim of quack selling snake oil. And in 1971, the American Academy of Pediatrics said there's no medical indication for it, period. That was the extent of their guidelines in 1971. Not medically indicated means there's no need for it and it's not desirable. So they know that. And once they used to circumcise boys without even asking the parents, which is clearly unlawful. You must have permission for every operation, even if it's needed or it's a battery. So all of those circumcisions were a battery. Um, but then what happened is they probably got sued, the American Academy of Pediatrics or some doctors in hospitals. So then they, they said, all right, well now circumcision is elective. You know, it's not routine anymore. We don't just do it routinely, like when it, whenever a child's born, even right after they were born, um, sometimes immediately in, you know, right in the delivery room, the first thing. So they need permission. And then once they needed permission and they said it was elective or a choice, a lot of parents decided they against it. And what happened is the circumcision rates declined. Well, this is a multi-billion dollar per year industry. So according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, each circumcision can cost upwards of $1,750 when hospital fees are included, nurses, assistants, and anesthesia if it's used. And so I think Intact America, I believe, is estimated one and a half million boys are circumcised per year. So it's up to 1,750 
uh, each. So uh, can't do the math in my head, but I think it comes to billions of dollars per year. But that's just this year. What about last year, the year before, the year before? It used to be 200 million. So 2 million boys per year were circumcised. So not only is it a multi-billion dollar industry to circumcise boys, but a lot of them need revision surgery or you know, repair surgery to fix the, the errors that were caused by the first. So that's another big business. Um, I, I wish I had the numbers at hand, but it's some significant percentage of the number of boys circumcised need to be circumcised again. Um, but then, in, so, so you have to add that to the about two and a half billion dollars base. So that's probably takes you to $3 billion a year industry now. But then the, the, some hospitals, we don't know how many, sell the foreskins to the pharmaceutical um, and cosmetic industry. So in the book, I say, well, look, I don't know how many foreskins are being sold, but we know it's happening. And I, 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 I know I've seen foreskins for sale online. I went online once and I was able to, could have put it in my shopping cart. You could order it up if you're, you know, a pharmaceutical company, you order it online. You know, illegally harvested, crim criminally taken, you know, from boys and they sell them and make them into uh, material for skin grafts and other valuable enterprises. But in the book, what I say is the pharmaceutical industry, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. They don't produce drugs unless it's going to produce billions of dollars in revenue. I think it can cost up to a billion dollars to get approval of, of a new drug. It's not a drug, but what I'm saying is the pharmaceutical companies, they don't do anything that isn't worth a billion dollars. So my guess is the industry could five billion dollars or more per year. I see. And is this, the, the, I mean, that's a, it's a staggering amount and that doesn't even co cover the pain of the or the uh, uh, violation of rights or the torture or the... The pain and suffering, yeah, exactly. So um, that's exactly right. So the question is, what would be, if, you, if a, a, a man, or let's say, forgetting about the statute of limitations, let's say a boy turn, reaches the age of majority, brings suit and he wins. You know, what's the value of, of um, what should he recover? Well, you have the extreme pain and suffering, uh, you know, extreme for a short period of time, but then you have the suffering that continues for, you know, maybe four to six weeks thereafter. And then you have psychological harm that's caused to people. But then what I argue in the book is there that these boys and men are also entitled to all the profits that the, um, all of these industries get from the foreskin because they weren't allowed to take it in the first place. And so if they win, they should get a percentage of the hospital's profits, the doctor's profits and the profits on the sale of the foreskin, whatever that may be. But even just looking at, well, I've left out the most important, the loss of the most sensitive part of the penis for life that also facilitates comfortable sexual intercourse. So what is that worth? Well, I mean, I would argue it's priceless. Um, you, you can't put a price on it. People wouldn't go and give up part of their penis. Men don't volunteer to be circumcised. So th this notion, the American Ep Academy of Pediatrics, or sometimes they talk about, well, men, you know, can decide for themselves when they reach the age of majority. Men don't, who have a foreskin, they don't sit around thinking, oh, gee, maybe I'll go into the hospital and, and have it cut off. That's just part of it the preposterous claims that the medical industry makes, like it's cleaner and it avoids embarrassment in the, in the locker room. Who cares about that? Men who have a foreskin, they don't give it up for anything. So in court, the uh, good uh, lawyer would argue that yeah, this is worth a whole lot of money. Um, and now in the past, so um, attorneys for the rights of the child has a page where they talk about um, uh, judgments. So where the, the most money is. And I believe there was one judgment for $32 million. But, and so I'm guessing that because um, circumcision is a deeply embedded cultural norm in the US, you know, judges and juries may not really realize, you know, what the amount of, what the loss is and may not put a very big price on it. But I think that's going to change. 
once people realize it's the most sensitive part of the penis, once people say how angry they are and they have psychological problems and realize how bad the pain and suffering was um, and the lifelong you know, impact on sexuality, I mean, I would think we're talking millions of dollars in every case, in, in my view. So that's, we're in now the millions times millions. So it's uh, millions times a hundred million. So it's like a trillion or a uh, hundred. I don't know about trillions, yeah, but, but yeah. you're right. But the multiplier effect of, you know, costing $1,750 each, you have the pain and the suffering, and then you have the loss of foreskin and the, the profits and you, you get times, you know, 150 million people you're getting up to, well, it probably is trillions of dollars actually. Um, I, 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 again, I haven't done the math, but it's an awful lot of money. And is it fair to say that that liability already exists today? That because the, the, the crime has already been committed and the damage has already been done, that the liability already exists? Yes, yes. That's, I mean, the, I mean, legal scholars have been arguing this since 1985 without serious opposition. So in 1985, William Brigman wrote um, an article, Circumcision as Child Abuse. And, you know, he said children have been exploited throughout history. And uh, one of the ways they've been exploited is uh, uh, genital cutting. I don't know if he mentioned female genital cutting, but it has to be treated the same way as male genital cutting from the legal perspective. And he said it's child abuse. You know, child abuse is defined in such a way as, you know, uh, impairing a, a, a physical, an organ. And, and, and if you seriously impair a, an organ, it's, then it's um, serious child abuse. So what I'm saying is it, that um, non-therapeutic elective circumcision violates the child abuse statutes plainly. And nobody's really argued otherwise. So I was in a debate where Steven Svoboda argued that circumcision violates the rights to child. And he was debating to, well, a Bra a Dr. Michael Brady from the American Academy of Pediatrics, but uh, Douglas DiCamo was there also, the ethicist on the American Academy of Pediatrics. And so on, on uh, day one, uh, Svoboda made a, a very compelling arguments that circumcision Circumcision is already illegal, it's child abuse, and it's a battery. And so then it was a chance for Dr. Brady to talk. And the title of the debate was, you know, is circumcision ethical and legal? And the, he had, uh, Dr. Brady had one slide, and all it said is no doctor has ever been held liable for a properly performed circumcision. Well, that's ridiculous. That's like saying slavery, you know, we had 100 years of slavery and nobody stopped it. Well, you know, it was never lost you know, to enslave a person even before the, uh, the constitutional amendment made it illegal. And um, yes, uh, circumcision is, is illegal as all get out already. Now, uh, Harry uh, granted no court in the U.S. has ever ruled that, but courts in Europe, numerous courts, I think about 10 by my count, they're in the book, I would count the number in the book. Uh, courts in Germany, Austria, and uh, two in England um, have ruled that it, it, there is no religious right to circumcise a boy, a right to circumcise a boy for religious reasons. So then there would be no right to circumcise a boy for cultural reasons or so that the penis will look like daddy or for any reason other than a valid medical reason. Well, the only valid medical reason would be that you need the operation and there's no alternative. Um, but boys hardly ever do need the operation. They're usually our alternative. Um, so, for example, uh, urinary tract infections, that's a completely bogus argument that it reduces the risk of urinary tract infections or prevents them. Well, it doesn't prevent them. And the claim is it reduces them by 1%. The claim is unproven. But even if it were true, um, urinary tract infections can be treated with antibiotics. That's the proper approach. You know, no uh, child able to reason would ever say, go ahead and <laughs> part of my penis in the one in 100 chance that, that it will prevent a urinary tract infection because urinary tract infections aren't a problem. They can be treated. And another point, Harry, is that the implications, people may not realize this, this means 100 people will be harmed 
100 boys and men will be harmed by circumcision. They're going to have pain and they're going to have the loss of foreskin for life in the off chance that it might prevent a urinary tract infection in only one of them. So 99 out of 100 won't have any benefit at all. And that violates fundamental rules of, of medicine. I mean, doctors can't go around cutting off healthy body parts in the off chance it might, you know, prevent some disease. That's just a, you know, a, a, a wacky. I wonder if there's a model of, of other cases where there have been uh, improper or forced amputations and settlements, what the settlements were for. I mean, I mean, it's, it's somebody uh, improperly cuts off a leg or, or a foot or a finger or whatever without, without proper, you know, without proper medical justification. I mean, surely there must have been cases like that and, and there must have been settlements that would provide at least a, a rule of thumb for what uh, an unnecessary amputation, uh, what the, what the uh, liability is for that. Yeah, so I don't know the question of what liabilities juries have found. But I did find cases um, that uh, say, as you would expect, that it's unlawful to cut, uh, sorry, to perform unnecessary surgery on a healthy person. The exception would be cosmetic surgery with adult consent. But um, in uh, Tortorella v. Castro, the Appeals Court of California said, it seems self-evident that it is injurious um, to uh, perform unnecessary surgery. I mean, it, it causes pain, it risks complications, and you have a loss of the body part. Um, and then in another case, Lloyd versus Kramer, the court said unnecessary surgery on a, on a healthy person gives rise to claims for battery, which is an unlawful touching, and for a breach of fiduciary duty. So breach of fiduciary duty is a breach of trust. So, this is a really important concept in medicine. In, in a lot of the world, like in business, um, business is known to be rough and tough. And you can compete you know, strongly or in a tough manner as long as it isn't unfair and deceptive. And if you're a business and you're hurt, you have to prove you were hurt and that you were wrong. But in medicine, it's different. There's, the physician has a fiduciary duty to act in the best interest of his or her patient. And it's based on trust because the public doesn't know anything about medicine. And boys don't, they're below the age of consent and infants can't even think or reason. So medicine is completely based on trust. And so these doctors are held to the highest standard in the law. The fiduciary duty to a patient is the highest duty in the law. And so what I'm leading up to is if a doctor breaches the trust that a patient places in the physician, then the, the patient can sue for breach of fiduciary duty. And the burden falls to the doctor to prove that he or she had a valid reason for having removed a body part, performed surgery. And what I argue in the book, it'll never be possible to justify removing the foreskin any more than it would be to perform um, genital cutting on a girl or to remove a finger, exactly your case, um, unless it needed to be removed and there was no alternative. And I think you've, you've touched on something important that what I argue in the book is that the doctors try to make this look complex, that you know they talk about the pros and cons. They want you to start weighing the pros and cons which lay people do, they don't know anything about medicine. And you know, what the book says, it's all pretty simple. You can't cut off a healthy part of a child's body, period. It doesn't matter what the body part was, and it doesn't matter what arguments you make in favor, it, you'll never be able to justify it. it's completely indefensible. So you know that all the arguments that have been made in the past are malarkey, and you know that all the ones they make today are malarkey, and all the ones they could ever make in the future are malarkey or Brian Earp calls them BS, would be more accurate. Right, right. So it, it is stunning that, that we are still, that all of this is still going on. And it just, it shows that uh, uh, the medical profession will never get their own house in order. 
it just it, without lawsuits, they'll never, I, there's no indication, no sense that they have any shame, any responsibility, any, any, any decency, nothing. I mean, it's just like you expect so, I mean, my expectations for doctors are so different from this reality that they have, they have absolutely, it's, it's just, it's just unbelievable. I mean, well, it's believable because it's a reality, but they they will never fix it on their own. They, it's only lawsuits that will change it. Yeah, Harry, I mean, I agree with you. Um, so uh, doctors have um, made more than 100 false claims about um, circumcision preventing or curing disease in the last 150 years. And in other words, they've claimed that it prevents or cures more than 100 diseases. In addition to making ridiculous arguments such as it's cleaner, it's better, it avoids embarrassment in the locker room and, and other plainly specious reasons. So you have 150 years of false medical claims and of frivolous claims and the false legal claim that parents have the right to elect it and doctors have the right to take orders from parents to cut off a healthy part of a child's body. It's just a complete non-starter. And so it, it looks to me as if the tide is turning against circumcision. Um, although the American Academy of Pediatrics tried to reverse that in 2012. And the numbers show that they, they, were, they were able to uh, revive Medicaid coverage in three states and um, they've been able to increase the number of circumcisions by making brazen false claims. So, you know, in the book I say, um, well, what can be done other than suing doctors, you know, that might help? And one thing that's extremely valuable is what you and the bloodstained men and women do, taking to the streets, it really can't be underestimated how um, important that is. Because, uh, you know, Quick doesn't read legal articles. They're not, they're not looking for the latest publication in the Cornell Journal of Law and Public Policy. They wouldn't want to read it anyway, but they see people on the streets. But what I say in the book after saying, well, we could have better consent forms and you know, we could lobby legislators and we could do this and we could do that. And I say, but look, let's be realistic. They're just not going to stop. And as I said a little earlier, doctors have become even more brazen. They, they just make crazy claims like prevents HIV. The 2012 American Academy of Pediatrics um, circumcision guidelines literally say that circumcision prevents HIV, penile cancer and urinary tract infections when they, they know that's false. They know the actual claim is it reduces the risk of penile cancer by like one in 400,000 or a crazy number. Um, and that's highly contested too. I mean, that, that claim is contested, even though it's small, it's, it's also in doubt. Yeah. So one of the things I say in the book is um, because physicians have this fiduciary duty, they have to be honest, they can't go around making false claims that they can't prove. They have the burden of proving these claims. Um, you know, they need to prove that it prevents HIV. If they're going to claim that, they'll never be able to do that because it doesn't. We have more HIV in the U.S. than in Europe where boys aren't circumcised. Um, and uh, I believe it's contested whether it reduces the risk of penile cancer as well. And so these claims that it reduces the risk of these diseases, they're, they're pretextual rationalizations that have been used um, effectively to sell circumcision after it was known that it doesn't do anybody any good, but it it sounds it sounds like a reason, but it it really isn't. Like, it's the latest, most scary uh, bugaboo, and that's what they always have used. Well, that's exactly. I, I, so the 2012 AAP statement expired in 2017 because after five years it has to be renewed or it expires. So it's expired, but. The CDC picked it up and has a ruling that says that uh, they, have, they have guidelines for physicians should counsel uh, parents to circumcise their boy to prevent HIV. And that's in force, correct? Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so um, you're right. The AAP guidelines in, in 2012 expired five years later, automatically in 2017. One point I would make about that though is even though they've expired, they haven't uh, withdrawn them or renounced them, right? So all these claims that were widely publicized, 
you know, that people bought into and that increased the circumcision rate, those claims are still out there. It's as if it's as if they're making them to this day. It doesn't matter that they've expired. They're still out there and influential. Um, so if the AAP was doing its job, it would it would um, renounce them. Uh, but as you say, the CDC picked it up. So you might think, okay, these are two powerful organizations. They must know what they're talking about. You know, there must be something to it. And the, the fact is that the people who wrote those guidelines, they're the same people. So Robert Van Howe uh, tells me that um, the people who wrote the AAP guidelines are the who's who of circumcision advocates. And some of them have a, a religious bias in favor of circumcision. Um, you know, they're religious adherents and they're desperate preserve, to preserve it as a religious right. So it's a huge conflict of interest. Well, the fact that the CDC said the same thing, it isn't more persuasive. It's really more evidence of how it's a tiny little cabal, if I'm using the right word, of people who have enormous financial as well as, in some cases, religious incentives to perpetuate circumcision. And when there's a religious conflict of interest, is that required to be disclosed? I've never seen that before where I'm yes. a Jew, therefore I cannot, or I, I have a conflict of interest in this discussion. Absolutely, and I, I think I can uh, prove that the American Academy of Pediatrics knows this because when it came out with its guidelines, it said, does anybody have comments on these guidelines? And I was one of the people who made comments. And it says, do you have any conflict of interest? In medicine, you have to disclose any conflict of interest. So you might think, well, religion and, and medicine, they're supposed to be different. So do you have to disclose if you have a bias in favor of religious reasons? The answer is absolutely yes. You know, if you have any bias that might prevent you from doing your job as a doctor, you must disclose it, yes. And so that they haven't disclosed financial bias or the religious bias or their cultural bias. So um, that's also disqualifying another fraud really I mean uh, not to disclose your your biases like how how would anybody know that the that the members of the AAP um, quite a few of them are Jewish and many Jews believe that it's a sacred religious right to circumcise your son and one of the members of the AAP um, his name published an article, uh, essentially saying, well, nobody really has their son circumcised for medical reasons anyway. Um, you know, they do it for religious and cultural and personal reasons. And he circumcised his own son, he said, because he had thousands of years of ancestors looking over his shoulder. And then he argued that why should all penises have to look the same? And reading that, I was just astonished. So basically they're admitting what they knew in 1971, it's not, um, there's no medical indication in a circumcised boy. There's no valid medical reason. People don't really circumcise their children for medical reason. They circumcise boys for religious, cultural, and mostly so that for personal reasons, meaning so that the penis will look like daddy. There's absolutely no way doctors are allowed to take orders from parents to cut off a body part for reasons having nothing to do with medicine. It's just a non-starter. So yeah, yeah. Medicine I has says you that about that that doctors do this. It's astonishing, but you know there there's well, I consider it an evil. I, in the there's a lot of evil in the world, but you wouldn't think it would be perpetrated on you know infants uh, and 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 right. So yeah, um, medicine I mean, has to be based on science, not religion. I mean, they're not. There's religion is not a it's not science. There's there's no there's no truck there. There's there's no absolute. There's no exception, is there? I mean, no, no, there isn't. There isn't. The doctor, I'm sorry, medical students. They go to medical school, and they study science and medicine, and they learn how to diagnose illness. They they, they are told they they take the Hippocratic oath, whereby they promise not to harm anybody. You know, first do no harm. You don't take a healthy person and harm them, which is what you know, non-therapeutic force, non-consensual circumcision does. And when they do have a patient with a medical condition, they have to diagnose the medical condition. They have to consider alternatives, weigh alternatives. And then they, they have to discuss the alternatives with the patient. So if they were doing their jobs, they would say, well, we don't have any diagnosis here. They're perfectly healthy. So they're not allowed to go to the next phase of do we cut it off? 
you, you only get to that if it needs to be treated. Then if you, if let's say you have a penile condition that needs to be treated, then the question is what's the most conservative treatment that can be done? So let's say you cut your, your foot. Well, you put a bandaid on it, you don't cut it off. I mean, you could treat it by cutting it off, but you'd lose the leg. So you put a bandaid on it. It's, this is all sort of basic. It took me a long time to realize it's all sort of basic. That yeah. we all intuitively know. We all intuitively know that it's not a good idea to cut off part of a boy's penis. And the doctor's responsibility is to the child, not to the parents. What the parents want is not has no no bearing. Uh, yeah, is that exactly correct? Exactly right, Harry. And and the American Academy of Pediatrics itself said that. There's um, uh, an article written by the Committee on um, uh, uh, on, on Children um, Ethics and Children, and it said that the proxy consent poses serious. Um, issues. In other words, that's when a parent consents on behalf of the child. And it's, it went on to say the duty of a physician is to provide competent medical care, meaning the care that the patient needs, regardless and without, irrespective of the desires of the parent. So of course, the parents may have desires that are different from what's best for the health of the child, but the doctor is not allowed to take them into consideration. So the notion that a person who believes that circumcision is required by their God can go to a doctor and say, I believe my God commanded it, so please cut off part of my son's penis. There's absolutely no way a doctor is allowed to take that into consideration. Yeah, so the, another, another lie that the AAP's task force has presented you you mentioned also big tobacco and the and the way they've defrauded people and how they were held to account for defrauding. I, I think uh, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but uh, when I was reading about it, uh, U.S. versus Philip Morris, two thousand six. Philip Morris was uh, charged under the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act or the RICO Act. So. You never mentioned racketeering as a possible charge against the AAP. And I'm wondering if Big Tobacco was charged as racketeers because they lied to people about the addictive quality of tobacco and the health problems of tobacco, would the AAP also be subject to a RICO Act um, uh, charge? Well, that's a really interesting question, Harry. You're ahead of me. I never thought about it. Um, so I, I'm not that knowledgeable about class actions, but if a class action lawsuit could be brought, as was brought against cigarette companies, that would be the best way to proceed because then it would represent a whole class of injured people and the injured people wouldn't have to pay for the representation. So RICO, I only know a little bit about it, but I think it comes into effect when there's uh, uh, a fraud, maybe against the government, I'm not sure, where there's more than one fraud, sort of repeated instances, but I think it only has to be two. And so that I think- I, I, be I believe it includes terror, terrorizing and certainly mutilating a boy without anesthetic is terrorizing him and uh, confinement or, or false imprisonment. So uh, this you, 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 yeah, you raised that. So, I mean, whether that's an open avenue of, of per pursuit against AAP is, is a question just to consider. I, I don't know. So you probably know there is a lawsuit right now against the American Academy of Pediatrics. And it's um, the lawsuit alleges they defrauded uh, the public and parents and boys in uh, its, not there, in its 1989 and 1999 guidelines. So, uh, it's the same claim that could be brought today about the 2012 guidelines. And lawyers are standing by ready to bring that suit. So this is like a you know a starter suit, if you will. And uh, it's pending in, um, in uh, New Jersey. So um, there are lawsuits that are coming to USA. I, I, you know, I think doctors uh, probably haven't been so scared because uh, nobody's held them liable to date, but, you know, the European cases, uh, um, 
somewhere close to 10 of them find it's unlawful and a crime, criminal assault. And uh, the best thing that doctors could do is put down a knife right now. At least they'll, you know, they won't be liable for anything in future. Otherwise, every time they, they perform a circumcision, they can be held liable. And um, also there's a possibility of punitive damages not to be underestimated. Whenever, um, uh, you know, a, a defendant engages in really in conduct and reckless indifference to safety and health, um, uh, they can be held liable for, for punitive damages that could be unlimited in amount. And uh, I think that um, it would be appropriate to uh, award uh, very large punitive damages against the American Academy of Pediatrics. Yes, absolutely. Also, the sale of the foreskin, would that fall as or organ theft? Would that be covered under organ theft or some human tra human trafficking issues? Or uh, is there any, yeah. any avenue there? Yeah, I think so. Um, so I looked up the law when I was finishing the book. And so I was trying to think, well, uh, if I can explain is if, if, if an, a, an activity is criminal, you can't make a contract about it. You know, you can't have a contract to kill somebody, obviously, if you had that contract, it would be void. So because it's criminal assault, and child abuse to circumcise a boy, in my view, all the contracts related to it, like the consent form and so on, they're all void. And uh, the contract to sell the foreskin to the pharmaceutical industry, those are void. Um, so then the question is, could the pharmaceutical industry be held liable? And um, uh, what I found is, that it's a crime under federal law and a crime under state law in Massachusetts and presumably in every state in the nation um, to knowingly uh, purchase uh, or use or resell um, stolen property. And so I think these uh, unlawfully harvested foreskins are stolen property. And so all that's needed is that the pharmaceutical companies know that, that's stolen property. So what I think should happen is that people should write to all these pharmaceutical companies, certified letters and put them on notice that they're using stolen property. And uh -huh. then, then they could be criminally prosecuted under federal and state law. Awesome. And the only issue is because the doctors, people listen to the doctors and trust them and believe them, and because it's a deeply embedded cultural norm, um, you know, the state and federal governments are not prosecuting this yet. I mean, you can go to your, you know, local police and report child abuse. And I know somebody who tried it and you don't get anywhere. They, they don't know it's child abuse. And so in the book, I argue it's the perfect crime. Uh, the perfect crime is one where, you know, you don't know who, who, who did it to you or, and, and, and you don't know it's a crime, like, you know, unless somebody explains it, it's the perfect crime. It's also the perfect fraud. People don't know they've been defrauded. So I, but I think that public opinion is turning against circumcision pretty fast. And um, um, George Ann Chapin of Intact America said that the way these movements work is that, you know, at first they make their arguments like, gay hey, people should have rights and nobody believes them. And, you know, then slowly people start to accept it. And, and apparently it happens fairly rapidly where you don't need to get to 50% or something for the public. I'm not sure I'm expressing this well, but once about a third of the people, you know, see that this is unlawful, unfair, whatever, then public opinion rapidly turns against it. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking over the next few years, they and the younger people as well, they don't, they don't buy this stuff. When I talk to young people that you don't have to really argue with them. You know, I, I say I'm opposed to circumcision. They're like, well, of course. It, you know, right. It was, right. Yeah. We just need the older people to die off. I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, that's the science advances one funeral at a time as the, the old saying goes. It, I'm not really in favor of older people dying, but... Uh, and realistically, you know, when this generation of doctors is gone and legislators and, you know, young people and more women come into power, then, you know, the tide will turn against us even more. 
but I think it's turning pretty. Right. And uh, the other thing is that I wondered is when the, the, C, uh, the CDC and the AAP had their guidelines, um, is part of the motivation in that cover against lawsuits so that they know they have this liability and they know that, that you know, the dam could burst at any time and, and they could be bankrupt because they can't possibly come up with a trillion dollars to pay out their, the claims if they were to all show up. Is part of the motivation just to cover their asses so that uh, they have, they, they, can, they can dodge the liability? Yeah, you're asking great questions, all of them, especially since you're not a lawyer. But in the um, lawsuit that was brought based on the 1989 and 1999 guidelines, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the claim is made that, that the AAP was afraid of lawsuits. There had been a lawsuit and it was settled successfully. And they were afraid that they were going to be sued. Doctors and, or, well, doctors would be sued for circumcisions. So they came up with the idea that circumcision reduces the risk of urinary tract infections in 1989. And that when they did, they knew their studies were flawed. And um, as a legal scholar, Matthew Gianetti, who said that the AAP could be held liable for negligent misrepresentations and possibly intentionally fraudulent misrepresentations. In other words, exactly as you said, they came up with UTIs as a pretext um, to uh, defend the industry against claims that you couldn't do this. And so yes, history repeated itself, has repeated itself. There were declining circumcision rates. The AAP was very worried about physicians being sued. They're a trade association, they represent physicians. It came up with HIV, our disease of the day, as a reason to circumcise, and probably quite effectively, you know, because people are afraid of HIV. Um, and it turns out, well, it doesn't prevent HIV. And the claim was it reduces it by 60%. That's misleading because it's 60% is relative terms. The claim really is it reduces it by 1.3% in Africa. And those studies were flawed. So once again, they're using flawed studies. It's just another pretext. But right. if you, it, it's terrible advice. Like you might want to have your son circumcised to reduce the risk of HIV. What you really want to be telling people is whether you're circumcised or not, you're at risk of getting HIV. You cannot count on circumcision to do anything for you. The chance of it helping any boy or man are close to zero. If you want to avoid HIV, you need to practice safe sex or avoid unsafe sex, in which case it won't be of any advantage to have been circumcised. So there is no medical benefit whatsoever to being circumcised. There's no medical reason why you would choose. Yeah, I, I once had a, a, a professional, a real estate professional, of, you know, in a first world country tell me he couldn't get HIV because he was circumcised. I mean, he was like, he was convinced. He was like, well, no, I can't get HIV because I'm circumcised. It's, well, it's, it's called risk compensation is, you know, the, uh, the official term, I guess, academic term. And what it means is, you know, people, they, they assume a risk because they think they're not. So the, the claim by the AAP that it reduces the risk of HIV or prevent it is going to cause more HIV. Exactly, exactly. It just, but they don't care. They just don't care. They, all, they don't care what harm they do to, to babies, to men, to, to society. They just don't care. That's what really gets me is that for, they just don't care. They're just, it's like how immoral, how irresponsible. These are supposed to, supposed to be the most trusted members of society and they're utterly irresponsible people. I completely agree with you. I just want to give an example of that. When we were at the debate with Stephen Svoboda versus Michael Brady, Alice Deacon, and the ethicist. So Svoboda said, well, this violates the rights of the child um, to bodily integrity and self-determination or autonomy. Autonomy is a fundamental concept in medicine. You always need to obtain the patient's consent whenever possible. And if they're a child, that doesn't mean you, you go ask their parents. It means you wait until they're able to consent on their own. 
So you, you're required to leave them alone. So Svoboda, who's brilliant, made this absolutely compelling case. And so the next day, as I said, uh, Dr. Brady, all he said is nobody's ever been held liable for properly performed circumcision. So I, I spoke and I said, well, who cares? Nobody's ever been held liable. It hasn't been prosecuted. There are lots of crimes that aren't you know, prosecuted. And then, and then I said to them, well, you know, attorney Svoboda made a very compelling case that this violates the rights of the child. What do you have to say for yourself? And then Dr. Dekema, to the best of my knowledge, said, well, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics does not adhere to the notion that children have these rights. And I was thinking to myself, these rights date back to the 1600s. These are inalienable rights, the right to personal security or bodily integrity and the right to autonomy or freedom are absolutely fundamental, inalienable, the most basic fundamental rights that anybody has. And the U.S. adopted all of English uh, common law, um, you know, shortly after uh, the, the country was formed. And um, you can't just ignore the fact that children have rights. So they, they make these claims that children have no rights. Well, where, where are you going to find that in the law? You know, you don't have to go look it up to know that they're wrong. They, they yeah. never pick it up with anything. It's, it's all malarkey. You know, I, I don't like to swear, but uh, Brian Earp says, he wrote an article that appears very much to be about circumcision. And he said, you know, what if you have somebody like Voldemort who doesn't care about the rules and doesn't play fair and is willing to make any claims and just keep making them one after another so that so fast that people can't even respond to them. And it's certainly my view that that's what um, the American Medical, uh, it, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics has done. And by the way, um, uh, it's the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has endorsed the AAP, so they, they're making the same claims, whether they made them or not. They say, we agree with all this. I mean, how they can do that, I, I really don't know. I did want to say there could be individual physicians, you know, who they, they might think that they, they, they have a medical basis for this, some of them. But, but I think once you've performed one circumcision, you would know. Like if you're a medical student and an attending physician tells you to assist, you know, you've never seen one before, you don't know what it is and you think it's medicine and so you do it. But I think after you've seen one, you know, you're causing incredible pain to the baby. You know, any lay person would start thinking, should Doing this well, if lay people were thinking that, well, the doctors should be thinking that. So, um, so I, I do think a, a lot of them are. I mean, I view them as evil. I I don't see how anybody could do this to uh, to any boy of any age, and um, you know, especially a newborn. Uh, make one more point, Harry. Also, that uh, it might cause neurological damage. I mean. Uh, Experiments in rats show if you expose them to extreme pain in, in uh, infancy in the neonatal period, it can cause um, uh, a neurological damage. Um, it can damage their brains and uh, it can also cause psychological harm. It's traumatic, um, as Ronald Goldman, the psychologist, writes. Uh, how anybody can do this to a, a baby in the 21st century and how the government can let it get away with it um, because, um, you know, states use Medicaid to pay for it. And that's unlawful too. Uh, the doctors, right. the doctors uh, defraud the Medicaid program because they certify that it's medically necessary. They need to do that to get paid. So every time they perform a circumcision on a healthy child, they use a false diagnosis and they falsely certify that it's medically necessary. And the government lets them get away with it. And when Massachusetts challenged the Medicaid funding, uh, how did that turn out? I, I didn't well, hear I'm the really end of that. Pleased. Yeah, I'm lead counsel, and I'm really pleased to report that so far we're winning the case. Awesome. Uh, the, uh, um, we taxpayers brought suit under a statute that gives the right to, of taxpayers to sue whenever money's being spent unlawfully by the state in violation of some clear law. And so we say, well, the doctors are committing Medicaid fraud and the state is supposed to stop it. The state is supposed to require proof of medical necessity and the state is um, required to set up an institutional review board to review those payments 
and it hasn't done so. So the state, instead of saying, yes, you're right, came up with all sorts of bogus arguments, you know, like we rely on the doctors. The doctors, they must be using their discretion. They must be, you know, know what's best. And we're saying, no, you have an independent, you're supposed to be an independent watchdog. You're not, you haven't set up a review board. And so the judge ruled in our favor that the taxpayers have the right to proceed on their claims that um, the, uh, that the, the, the state is violating state law. And so the judge um, wrote a lengthy opinion and he said, this is an important case and it's important to get it right and therefore, he referred it himself. It's called an interlocutory appeal, very unusual. And he sent it to the appeals court, and it's with the appeals court. And so uh, we submitted an appellate brief. The state replied. We, we said their arguments were no good. They have nothing. They're going to respond by the 15th, and then we have oral argument next month. But the bottom line is, so far, we're winning. We'd, I'd be very surprised. If the appeals court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts said that this statute, which is very clear in its wording, that, that if, they, if they ruled it, it doesn't apply. It seems to me this case is a layup, um, but, uh, but you know, we'll have to see. Awesome. Well, that's, that's really good work. I mean, that's a, a major win. Uh, if 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 we can if we can put that one in the bag, that's that's a major win. And yeah, good work. Just want to make a shout out to uh, co-counsel from Jersey, Andrew Delaney. He's a young man, and uh, he has uh, three circumcision lawsuits. He's he's one of the lead counsel in uh, suing the American Academy of Pediatrics, and uh, so it's good to see you know um, a zealous young capable attorneys in the field. Yes, yes. Yeah, they'll 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 take up the take up the baton at some point and yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's, I I've taken an hour of your time. It's probably more than I should, so I'm going to start wrapping it up. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say, Peter? Uh, I, th I think your your questions are so probing and allowed me to say anything that I would have offered to say. Um, I, I can't think of anything else. Uh, I, I guess if you're an opponent of circumcision, I would appreciate it if you would buy the book. Um, it's yes. uh, Circumcision is a Fraud um, and the Legal Reckoning. It's available on Amazon and it's uh, only costs uh, $2.99 to get the digital copy. And uh, if you like what you read and could leave a comment, that would all help the movement. And uh, certainly encourage people to take to the streets and join the bloodstained uh, men. I always think of calling in the bloodstained men and women because <laughs> there are women in it too. Yeah. It's very pleased about. Blood, yeah, bloodstained men and, and their friends is our technical, it's our actual name, but yeah. There yeah. you go. Every every impactivist, everybody seeing this video should have a copy of this on your bookshelf. This is essential reading, absolutely essential reading for every impactivist. If you don't get the hard copy, get the Kindle copy, the Kindle that has links that are live links. You can go right to all the references by clicking on the links. If you have the hard copy, get the Kindle copy too, because the links are, are very helpful and makes it a lot easier to, there's, there's as Peter said, there's 600 or so references it's a comprehensive volume. It's a serious work of, of scholarship and every intactivist should have a copy of it. This is a breakthrough for the intactivist movement. And we have Peter Adler to uh, thank for, for this wonderful effort. So thank you so much, Peter. It's been just a joy to talk to you and, and we hope I, I hope we can chat again again in the future. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure. Okay. I know.